In ecology, a community is all the populations of all the species in a given area. And community ecology is the study between or among species within that given area. Species can interact in several different ways that a community ecologist would study. Competition occurs when organisms use the same resource. And when organisms use the same resource, this lowers the fitness for both organisms. In other words, it's a negative relationship for both involved. It's a minus minus. When an organism consumes another, either by predation or parasitism, it increases the consumer's fitness while decreasing the victim's fitness. In other words, it's a plus minus relationship. When two species benefit from their interaction, they're involved in a mutualistic relationship. In other words, it's a plus plus relationship, or you can think of it as a symbiosis. When one species benefits from a relationship and the other is unaffected, this is said to be a commensalism. It's a plus zero relationship. Spanish moss is in a commensalism with the trees that it grows in. It benefits from being able to be on the trees, whereas it doesn't really affect the trees that it grows in. Competition is a minus-minus relationship between species. When two organisms compete, they lower both of their abilities to survive and reproduce, that is, their fitness. Competition between organisms of the same species is very common, and it's known as intraspecific competition. And it intensifies as the population density increases, density dependence. Whereas competition between species for the same resource is known as interspecific competition. In community ecology, the niche model predicts that the competition between species is limited because species that live in a specific area tend to use different resources. A great example of this is Darwin's finches. The niche model predicts that different species in a given area utilize different resources. So on a given island, there may be many different species of finches. However, the niche model would predict that they differ by their beak size. Species with smaller beaks can only eat smaller seeds, while species with larger beaks tend to eat larger seeds. And in this way, they limit the competition for limited resources. The resources a species can tolerate is known as its fundamental niche. For example, a plant can live within a specific range of water availability. If the environment is too dry, the plant will shrivel and die. But if the environment is too wet, the plant roots cannot receive enough carbon dioxide to go through cellular respiration and dies. However, when a species is in the same environment as one of its competitors, the range of its niche will change, and this is known as its realized niche. In the example on this graph, we have two species that compete for the same resource. One is a strong competitor and the other is weak. When these two species come into contact, the strong competitor squeezes out the weak competitor where their range of resources overlap. This is the weak species realized niche. In ecology, the competitive exclusion principle is a proposition which states that two species competing for the same resources cannot coexist if other ecological factors are constant. And the idea is that when one species has even the slightest advantage over another, the one with the advantage will outcompete and eventually dominate that species in the long term. And this leads to either the extinction of this competitor or an evolutionary or behavioral shift towards a different ecological niche. To test this hypothesis, G. F. Gauss conducted an experiment with the protist Paramecium. He grew two different species separately, and they grew logistically as expected by population ecological models. However, when he grew the Paramecium species together, one grew logistically as predicted by population ecology models, and the other went locally extinct. In other words, Gao suggested that complete competitors cannot coexist. But as it turns out, there's actually different kinds of competition. The previous example was a case of asymmetric competition. In asymmetric competition, one species highly outcompetes the other. In this way, one species suffers much greater fitness decline than its competitor. Asymmetric competition is driven by competitive exclusion. Species that suffer equal decrease in fitness is known as symmetric competition. However, this is really a continuum. Most competition relationships lie somewhere between asymmetric and symmetric competition. 
Consumption is when one organism eats another. When animals eat plants, it's known as herbivory. When animals eat other animals, it's known as predation. But when only small amounts of tissues are consumed, allowing the host to live, this is known as parasitism. Predators have a tendency to evolve traits that make them stronger, faster, and more fierce. And as these more efficient predators evolve, their prey were selected for as well. Slower, weaker prey tended to be consumed in greater numbers, and natural selection favored prey that were either unpalatable, more elusive, or had defensive capabilities. Consumption is so common that many organisms have evolved defenses against it. In fact, all animals are consumers in one way or another. Some animals hide within their environment to avoid consumption. This is known as avoidance or camouflage. Other animals have poison within them in order to inhibit predation. And many of these organisms are brightly colored, warning potential predators of the dangers within. Fish and herds of mammals practice a schooling behavior as a defense mechanism. When a predator comes in contact with a school of fish, for example, the shark can't concentrate on a single fish and becomes confused. And species that are common prey also fight back. This is why elephants have tusks, moose are the most dangerous animal in North America, and porcupines have spines. Some animals take advantage of certain animals that have poison within them, and they adopt the coloration of the dangerous animals with the advantage of avoiding predation. The three species in the above picture are all mimics of wasp, and none of them are toxic to predation. They have all evolved to resemble wasps, and a consequence they get consumed with less frequency. But animals don't get to have all the fun either. Orchids have also evolved to resemble wasps and bees. They produce a pheromone. Pheromones are sex chemicals that animals use to attract each other. And orchids are so well adapted to resemble these insects in the way they smell, as well as the way they look, that the males actually copulate with the orchids and they think that they're females. This is nature at its most cunning. We've discussed how the predators control the populations of herbivores. This is known as the top-down control of herbivores. But herbivores can also be controlled by their food supply, plants. And this is known as bottom-up control. In reality, herbivores are controlled by the combination of these factors. Mutualisms are symbiotic relationships between species and we've discussed several mutualistic relationships throughout this course. Mycorrhizal fungi exist in a mutualistic relationship with over 90% of all the plant species ever studied. Fungi provide increased water absorbing ability while the plants provide the fungi sugar. Also, flowering plants have developed a mutualistic relationship with their pollinators. The flowers get pollinated while the pollinators get food. And lichens are a mutualistic relationship between fungi and algae, with algae providing the sugars and fungi providing a home. Certain ants have a mutualistic relationship with acacia trees in the Amazon. The trees provide everything the ants need. They have thorns that are swollen as specialized chambers that serve as their homes, and the trees also dispense food packets that the ants consume. In return, the ants attack anything that comes too close to the tree. They attack animals that come too close, and they remove plants that would compete for light from the tree that they exist in. Pretty cool. Cleaner shrimp have a mutualistic relationship with certain fish species. They clean the inside of the fish's mouth, removing any parasites that may exist in the mouth of the fish. So the shrimp gets food and the fish gets the parasites removed. It's a mutualistic relationship. In ecological terms, a disturbance is an event that removes biomass from a community. And this directly affects resource availability. For certain species like plants, there's typically more available resources like light and space. For other species, including most animals, resources are typically diminished. And there's several factors that determine a disturbance regime. The type of disturbance, the frequency of disturbance, and how severe the disturbance is. A disturbance regime is the characteristic type of disturbance common to a specific area, and there are several types, from fire to hurricanes, avalanches, and even drought. And an interesting story exists regarding the great redwood forest of the west coast. The Smokey the Bear campaign sought to eliminate all fires in America, and it was so successful 
that wildfires were all but a thing of the past. And after several decades of a successful campaign, it was noted that there were no seedlings of redwoods. And in fact, there were no saplings of redwoods either. In other words, there was no young generation of redwood trees. It was hypothesized that this was because the fire regime had been altered to such an extent that the seeds of the redwoods were no longer able to germinate. So what'd they do? Fire was reintroduced in the great redwood forest and lo and behold, tons of seeds of redwood trees began sprouting. The conclusion, redwoods require a fire regime. Succession is the recovery of communities following a severe disturbance. If the disturbance is so severe that the soil and all the organisms are removed, this is known as primary succession, and it's not very common. But examples of this include volcanism at a large scale and avalanches at a small scale. And secondary succession is way more common. Secondary succession follows a disturbance where some or all of the organisms are removed, but the soil is more or less left intact. Examples of this include wildfires, hurricanes, small floods, and even drought. Following a very severe disturbance, succession of plant species typically follows a specific succession. The first plants to reach a new environment are known ecologically as R-selected species. They're also called pioneer species. The reason they're typically the first to reach a newly disturbed environment is that they have the ability to disperse their seeds long distances. These species are also typically small in size and short-lived. And pioneer species typically share a specific suite of adaptations. They put most of their energy into reproduction and are typically very poor competitors, but they're able to tolerate severe abiotic conditions like poor soil quality. In other words, pioneer species live fast and die young. They are the rock stars of the plant world. Late successional communities, in contrast, are dominated by K-selected species. These are long-lived and typically large in size. They're also known as climax species. They live slow and long. K-selected species are typically very good competitors and have high energy storage in their seeds. This makes their seeds large and heavy, which greatly inhibits their ability to be dispersed. In this way, climax species are slow to come to newly disturbed areas, but once they get there, they're very good competitors. Frederick Clements was a powerhouse of early ecology. He proposed that following a disturbance, ecological communities followed a series of predictable stages from R-selected species towards K-selected species, eventually resulting in what he termed climax communities. He proposed that pioneering species consisted solely of R-selected species. Those weedy species are then replaced by longer-lived, more competitive herbaceous species known as an early successional community. Clements hypothesized that those herbaceous species were then replaced by shrubs and short-lived trees, which he termed a mid-successional community. And finally, the shrubs and trees are replaced by long-lived, larger tree species. And once this plant community was established, it tended to replace itself until a major disturbance attacked that community. This was known as the climax community. The theory of island biogeography proposes that the number of species found on an undisturbed island is determined by immigration and extinction. And further, that the isolated populations may follow very different evolutionary routes, as shown by Darwin's observation of finches in the Galapagos Islands. Immigration with an I and immigration with an E are both affected by the distance of an island from the source of colonists. This is known as the distance effect. Usually, this source is the mainland, but it can also be other islands. Islands that are more isolated are less likely to receive immigrants than islands that are less isolated. And the rate of extinction once a species managed to colonize an island is affected by the island size. This is known as the area effect. It's also known as the species area curve. Larger islands contain larger habitat areas and opportunities for more different varieties of habitat. Larger habitat size reduces the probability of extinction due to chance events. And habitat heterogeneity increases the number of species that will be successful after immigration. This is known as the theory of island biogeography.